Hello, I'm Doug, and this is the Taste and Sensibility Channel. And this is honey review number 29, although we're not tasting a honey today. We're tasting these distilled spirits, adult beverages, strong drink that are made with honey. So what we have here is an American honeyed rye whiskey from a craft distillery. We have the famous Drambuie liqueur, which is a combination of Scotch whiskey and honey heather from Scotland and spices. And it's pretty famous and I have developed a taste for that. And this is a mead, that, a commercial mead from California, which I'm only using as a reference point to check my own homemade mead that I've done. This is my second batch now. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is good stuff. It's all based on honey, and let's get into it. If you like the reviews that you're seeing on this channel, be sure and give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Comment down below. Click on that subscribe button. Click on that bell notification. Do all those things that I say every single time, but usually at the end, we got to get some momentum here. So the first one here is an entry I didn't plan on until I went to the New Orleans Bourbon Festival. That day was about three weeks ago on March 22nd, 23rd. And I went to the Bourbon Women's Seminar and Peggy No Stevens of the Jim Beam family, the No family, the No family of Jim Beam fame was the moderator for this panel discussion. And this was a panel of accomplished women in the bourbon or bourbon industry who were master distillers and owners and CEOs and it was very interesting, all the stuff that they said. So I walked into the seminars and there was a set of pours in front of me on this placemat. I actually, I have it here, with stains and all, because sometimes you spell things. So these women were talking up front and answering questions and doing general introductions and the taste, the things before us weren't always the object of the discussion. So I was sipping on a couple of them, smelling a couple of them. One of them I went to right away and I sipped and I sipped and I sipped some more. And then I started looking around on either side of me. There was an unused set of pours in the empty seat beside me. And I took the corresponding pour from that place and sipped on that a while. And that one disappeared. And that made me pay attention when that woman was speaking from that craft distillery called Silverback Distillery. So the placemat said Silverback had a bourbon there. And I tasted that and I think it was good. But the one I remember was this honey rye. And I'm not a big fan of honey whiskeys or liqueurs or things like that. So that was kind of surprising to me. And then wanting the second one, it had a lot of rye notes and a lot of character that I wasn't used to. So that woman doing the talking about this was Christine Riggleman of Silverback Distillery. She's the matriarch of the family and looks like a, a distiller and she's in there running the equipment and doing stuff. Christine is on the left on all these photos with multiple people and there's a photo of her by herself. So I ran up and asked her after the panel discussion to, uh, if there's a heel of a bottle hanging around, please give it to me because I want to do a review on camera. So thank you, Christine. This is a wonderful gift and uh, it's probably going to make me drive to Virginia and buy a case. So I'm going to link to their website in the uh, description below, but the short version of what's in this bottle is that it's a liqueur made from the vodka from their distillery in a local honey from a beekeeper there in Virginia where, that, where they're based, mixed with a rye that they call Lucky 13. I think 13 months is the youngest age that they release it at. And I think the current releases are around two years now, two years old, according to their website. So the mixture of those two end up with this liqueur that is uh, 70 proof, 35% ABV, rye whiskey infused with real honey liqueur. So that's an interesting TTB name. So it's not exactly a liqueur itself, but it sounds like a whiskey. And I think this thing has won awards. This won the best uh, whiskey under four years last year and 2019. So, I mean, this is good stuff. It's getting noticed. The rye whiskey is getting noticed. I printed all that stuff out and I don't have it here in front of me, but maybe I'll link things down. You can just see it on their website. They uh, brag about it pretty well. 
So this is the first one I'm going to taste here, and this is my New Orleans Bourbon Festival glass I got at the tastings that we had both nights. So I'm going to pour a little bit and nose and smell it like I usually do with whiskeys. Well, it's a nice sounding glass. They really made this one just right. So on the nose, I get a honey. It's kind of like a clover. Wildflower, I can't place a particular kind really. But it's definitely a non-funky, non-floral, non variety non wood type nose to the honey part of it. But there's interesting notes underneath that make you go, wow, I want to drink that. Maybe mapley, brown sugary. It's not, oh, what is it? Maybe a hint, of, it may be grainy, maybe rye bread. The honey confuses it all because it's really sitting on top and damping down all the other notes you might be getting. So the nose is uh, not fully revealing of what's in there. on the taste. You, know, you can tell the ABV is at 35%. And there's honey, there's grassy herbal notes. And it's not really rye spice, but something's telling me it's rye for sure. It's a rye bread, it's a graininess. I just did a 20 rye shootout with a friend where everything was blind and so we tasted plenty of rice without knowing what they were. So I got lots of experience with rye notes there. And this one is just fun. It's dynamite. It's young. It's energetic. Explosive. Youthful. It's not those dull, drying, gr grainy things with little character. But this is like a, a bunch of Canadians bunch of Canadian bees at a party. Wow. Yeah, the rye bread, grassiness, herbal notes. I don't know. The rye just makes it totally different than anything I've tasted. And I know, I mean, I walk through liquor stores, I walk through liquor departments, and I see the Jim Beam and the Jack Daniels honey and the Evan Williams honey and the Wild Turkey American honey. I see all those things sitting on the shelf, and I just sort of ignore the whole category. Because mostly they're liqueurs, they don't really qualify as whiskeys for the most part. And they're for people who don't really like whiskey as a whole. Overall, that's what I always think of. But when I saw this one and tasted it, it was like, whoa, let me recalibrate here. I'm not going to be interested in those other mainstream honey whiskeys or honey liqueurs. I don't know what their category is. I never picked up a bottle and looked. But uh, wow, I am impressed with this one. And I want more. That's my third or fourth glass in my life. And I'm going to drive there and buy a case of this stuff. So thank you, Christine. You're doing a wonderful job there. And I guess as long as I'm there, I might as well pick up a couple other bottles of interesting things because I'm a, a whiskey guy, bourbon guy. I dabble in gin. And this one's just really good. And I'm sure it's not available to most of you people out there in YouTube land because you have to buy, buy it in a liquor store in Virginia or go to the distillery. They can only pour you so much at tastings. The potential audience for this one's going to be fairly small. But the combination of rye and the honey is dynamite. And I couldn't get enough. So moving on to the next thing. Before I taste, I'm going to do a few salty oyster crackers. And a sip of water. 
Okay, so this next one is Drambuie liqueur. The Isle of Skye liqueur, aged scotch whiskey, heather honey, herbs and spices. Now I was introduced to this three or four years ago by a friend and I've uh, bought a couple bottles since then, maybe four or five. I haven't opened, There's, I've got three left in reserve. But I'm gonna pour a little bit. Ooh, it's thick looking. Yeah, it's thick looking. Scotch is not that thick. And I kept trying to make this into some sort of talisker blend because it's from the Isle of Skye. But the fact that it's William Grant and Sons tells you they're the people that do, it's a company that owns Glenfiddich, uh, Balvenie, Tullamore Dew. There's something else there. Let me cheat and look at my notes. Monkey Shoulder. They do Monkey Shoulder. So I'm sure Monkey Shoulder has some of the malt comes from Balvenie. And I'm looked in, I've looked and don't remember, but this is a nice, beautiful yellow, honey colored, thick looking, syrupy looking liqueur. Oh, you smell spices on it. It's spiced, I don't know, cloves, cardamom, nutmeg. I don't have any idea what the spices, the combination could be so complex you're not going to pick them all out but it's a good combination you can smell that you're on the edge of some sort of sweetness but you don't really pick up the honey it's a hint that you're going to get some honey and the scottish heather honey that they used in this was in my challenging honey category for quite a while i wasn't a big fan i thought it was too weird too quirky too flavorful and then when I actually did the challenging honey video, I said, oh, well, I kind of like this. So I became a convert at that point, And I understood this a little bit better from that honey connection and from the scotch connection. Wow. It's aromatic and spicy. There's aromatic things going on, but nothing hot or peppery. But certainly sweet, but that's not the first thing it hits you. The spices hit you first. They're up in your nose and uh, the aromas come in before the taste. So that's a unique experience. Because they're so strong, they just, they're the first things to hit. So I'm not sure I can pick up the maltiness of the, of the Scotch whiskey. It's in there, I'm sure it's young. It might be defective for some other purpose. It might be not suitable for blending to a certain flavor profile. But uh, I think there's a lot of honey in here and a lot of spices that cover up any of those things. So I'm pretty sure it's gonna be Balvenie or Glenfiddich. Malt that goes in here in, in a fairly young age before it's developed a lot of value. But this is just so good. It's an interesting combination. The honey, the spices, and then the non-maltiness of the base. Whiskey. Makes it just a good thing to sip on. Now, some people put it on ice or have some water in it. But I like sipping it neat now. And this is at 43%. No, 40, 40%. So even when they put, throw in the honey and spices, they can keep it at the minimum 40% for whiskey, although it is a liqueur. So a pretty hefty punch there on the ABV. But the nose is wonderful, the taste is wonderful, but it tends to the sweet side, that's for sure. It's syrupy and thick. It's an after dinner thing. You're not gonna do it a lot. You might want some ice, you might want some water. But you sure get a punch of honey and a punch of spice, and it's a very good combination. So, Drambuie. I'll give a link to the story at Drambuie, but you don't need to look there for purchasing. This is in almost every liquor store, every liquor department. It's very readily available. So it's around. It's about forty bucks, maybe forty-five. U.S. most places.
Okay, next up on the list is a commercial mead I bought just as a reference point for my homemade mead because I didn't know what to taste, what it was going to taste like. I didn't have any reference at all. I never had it before, but this is from a regular wine department, liquor store, Chaucer's Mead. It's a California winery made from 100% pure honey. I'm looking for some kind of ABV. Didn't see it on the front. Delicious white wine with a guy on a white horse and a damsel not in distress sitting by. There it is. 10.5% alcohol by volume. So I'm going to pour a little bit in spite of the sticky cap that I'll never get rid of. Pour it in my little tasting jar. Pour it in my little tasting cup. And give you a few notes. I don't smell much. I do smell is connected to honey. I certainly know what it's made from. I get the edges of a white wine but it's not, it's just facing that direction. It's not gone any steps down that road. So wine-like, yes. White wine-like, yes. Not a lot of clues. And this is cool. It's been out of the refrigerator for a couple hours now. So it's almost to room temperature, but it might be 55, 60 degrees. It's not especially sweet. It's not especially fruity. There's no grape character, but you taste a little alcohol. You know, it's a wine. It's got some white wine characteristics, but no fruit, no grapes. So it's kind of like a white wine with a hole in the middle where you don't know what to make of it. Where some grape flavors might be or fruit flavors might be. It's just kind of a hole. It's been blurred out. It's a, it's a mystery. So nothing bad about it at all. It's not sharp. It's not unpleasant. There's no bad notes. Why people that don't like wine would like this stuff. They'll drink this readily. I would think it's not especially sweet. It's hard to tell that it's made from honey. So pleasant, unoffensive, nothing wrong with it and then this was the cheapest plainest version i could find because that's what i was going to make at home there's all other things on the shelf next to it that look you know full of, you know they call it call it viking blood and it's full of warriors and people it looks like people are going to jump out of the bottle with swords and dispatch you straight away so this is the entry level and I only bought it because YouTube threw me a video of people making their own, of uh, someone making their own mead. Now, this is a funny story because I got turned on to the modern rogue by, by watching the Whiskey Vault, which is backwards for most people. So all my Whiskey Vault viewing made them throw up modern rogue videos at me once in a while. And one of them was on this guy that made his, uh, showed them how to make meat. All right, Brian Brushwood. Uh, I should remember the other guy's name, but I don't. But uh, I'll link to the video down below in the description that got me onto this. But when I saw how simple it was, I said, sure. So last July, July of 2018, I made a batch. It was really simple. It was really good. It was not quite as fermented as I intended, so it was sweet and had some honey left over and residual sugar. But you could certainly tell it was yeasty and fermented and had alcohol in it. So this is my most recent bottling, and I did, I shot a lot of video of me making this. So I'm going to be showing that right after I do a little tasting here. So this one is uh, not as yeasty as the first time, but you can detect some yeast in there. It smells yeastier than it tastes. And this one fermented longer for sure. The sugar and the honey aromas and tastes aren't in there really. It's very close to this, but a little yeastier. It's not been, I filtered it a couple times through coffee filters or cheesecloth. 
and it clearly didn't take the uh, yeast out of it. Yeast are still floating around. I uh, killed them off or inhibited them with a little potassium sorbate. So if you're going to close it up, you need to kill off that fermentation. It's been uh, fermenting slowly in my refrigerator for the last month or so. I think I started at February 23rd. Uh, I stopped the fermentation mostly on about March 9th of this year, 2019. It's been in the fridge ever since. I filtered into a jug. You can see lots of stuff settled. I just took the top layer and filtered it through a coffee filter. Didn't really change it. It looks like this. But the it's an interesting process. It ends up being cheaper to make than any other wine you're going to come across. So this bottle was about $15 at my wine store that's complete enough to have this. And I see it online for $12.99. So that's for the some 50 size. But the gallon, no, three pounds of honey that I put into this gallon was only $20. And I got a gallon of honey wine out of it that's very tasty and unoffensive. And then you can do all the extra things like adding fruit to it. Lots of people add sweet cherries. Ends up very colorful and red. Uh, some people throw in the cherries during the fermentation. Other people control the fermentation carefully and know how far it goes and know the alcohol content. Then they add their fruits afterwards to, uh, to do the fruit flavor then. So there's different ways of doing it and I'm not going to be a nerd about any of that stuff or get into my own brewing or winemaking or mead making, but this is so simple. This is something anyone can do in your spare time. It all happens while you're at work. Only takes an hour on a Saturday to at the front end and at the back end or not even that long. So this is very worthwhile to do and to make. And the first batch sat in my refrigerator probably four months. It was just kind of in a carboy with a spigot and I would uh, pull some out whenever I felt like having a little light white wine. And it was very good and it didn't seem to change all that much over the four months that it was in the fridge. Likewise, this bottle was purchased back at that time. This has not been, I mean, it's been in the fridge and closed up, but I don't detect any oxidation or change in the flavor in the six, eight, eight months since I've owned this and had it open. And uh, I'm not done with it yet, but it, it won't last much longer. So I'm rambling now. So instead of rambling and listen, listening to me, you can uh, see a few video clips on how I made this mead. So I'm going to show you how easy it is to make some mead. So what do we have here? We have a gallon of spring water. You can, our tap water here is spring water, but it's treated with chlorine or chloramine or something that's going to inhibit microorganisms, which is not what we want when we have a crop of yeast that we want to raise. So. I just buy spring water. I have this other water jug that's empty. It's had other stuff in it. It had pineapple wine that I made last. It smells a little yeasty. But I rinse it out good. And I don't, I don't use those disinfectants or cleaners that a lot of people use when they're making their wine or beer. Uh, the yeast is going to be the biggest thing in there. The most uh, plentiful thing in there. And it's going to take over and I'm not all that worried about it. So until something bad happens to my stuff, I'm not going to worry about disinfecting. What else do I have? I've got three pounds of honey. This is a local honey. Just went to a farmer's market. This says Red Hill, Independence, Louisiana. So you probably can't read the label. This is a three pound jar of honey, which is perfect for this size. Uh, I have a packet of brewer's yeast. It's really made for wine. This is made for white wine. And I got it on Amazon. Tin pack was five or six dollars. So I'm going to use most of one pack of that. I'll measure it out with, the, with teaspoons. Also have some uh, golden raisins. Just I count is like 10, 15, 18 golden raisins. They help the yeast get started because the glucose, the grape sugar, is easier to chew on than the uh, more complex sugar in the honey. Uh, so. Also, I have a balloon, and I poked a small hole in it with a sewing needle. So it will be a one-way valve on top of the bottle. The yeast generate carbon dioxide. It gets out through the hole, but it's very hard for oxygen or 
air, other things that get into the bacteria or mold or different things that get into the ferment there. So we'll put this all together and then we'll uh, check on it every day or two so you can see uh, the progress. But it'll all be done in about 10 days, let it rest a couple days, filter it out and get it cold and then uh, we'll be drinking it before this honey series is over. So let's start doing some stuff. What do I want to do? I want to fill my empty jug half, about halfway with water. When I go about halfway, the three pounds of honey will take up most of the rest of the half, other half. And then we'll adjust at the very end with a little bit more water. It'll take some water to wash out the honey jar to make sure we get all of it. So that's about half. That's all we need to worry about right now. Now the hard part's gonna be holding, holding all this stuff up at camera height while three pounds of honey pours through this tiny little hole in the funnel. So this might be the part I didn't really think about too much. Uh-oh, going to have a drip here. Let's fix it. Mmm, good. Okay, so the battery ran out on the camera while I was pouring, but it uh, gave me a chance to uh, turn off the air conditioner, which was making a lot of racket. But you didn't really miss anything. It took a while. So what I'm going to do now is pour in a cup or two of water into the honey jar. Slosh that around and get it out. Well, you can see a lot of pollen and residue and crud at the top of the jar. It floats to the top since honey is so dense with sugar. Okay, that is enough stirring for me. I don't really care about getting that top honey or pollen or goo at the top because I don't know what all that is. Next little step is to shake this jar. Get this all mixed up. Because most of the honey is just sitting at the bottom. Now we can put in the golden raisins. We can put in a little more water. I guess I should wash the honey out of the funnel. And then we'll leave a little space. Might get foamy or gassy. Mm. It always gets sticky doing this stuff. Now, the last little thing here. I think I'm going to mix that a little more. I'm going to look for the raisins and see if I can. Okay, so all that's mixed really well. And let me see if the raisins are done at the bottom. Yeah, all the raisins are sitting on the bottom. I don't know if you can see that, that's pretty hard. But after a little fermentation, they're gonna be all gassy and floating at the top. So you'll see that later. And now here's the part that makes it all happen. There's more than a couple teaspoons of yeast in here, but I'm gonna, she brought scissors. I thought I was prepared. Okay. So I'm just gonna, just to do things in a measured amount. Gonna make 
measure a teaspoon of the yeast. And another teaspoon. Yep. Okay, it didn't quite make two teaspoons. I must be confusing this with my bread recipe. So that's the whole pack of yeast. And then this is gonna get a little mix, but don't keep that cap on long. When making bread, I usually proof the yeast, get it into uh, water before I put it into the dough. And I thought I was gonna do that here, but I forgot. But it's not that important. So the yeast was sitting on top on the foam and it is well dispersed. It's all over the place, I can see. So that's about all the mixing I can do. So this will kick off in a few hours or less. And I'm gonna put it in a dark pantry. So there's my balloon on and it's got a hole in it so it will never fully uh, expand inflate yes it will fail to inflate fully that's what those airline people say so i'm just going to put this away and we'll check back on it every day or two until it's done in 10 days or two weeks and i don't know how you test but it'll work here we go okay so this is day one of the mead ferment it's been about 24 hours and the mead is hiding in this little dark pantry so we're gonna pull it out and take a look. So what do we see here? A lot of raisins. We're up at the top, floating around. And the balloon is partially inflated, so it's building up some gas. So the golden raisins on top clearly have been gassy and full of CO2, and that it's about to kick off the rest of the fermentation, I think. So, it's going just fine. Okay, so I guess we can put it back for another day or two. Come back and check it every once in a while. But I usually do this little twist just to do a tiny bit of agitation and keep things from settling too hard on the bottom. So, goodbye till tomorrow. Okay, this is day eight of the mead making. And we're going to pull it up and take a look. So the balloon's partially inflated. So the CO2 is still coming. You can see the golden raisins are very puffy. Extended. Any wrinkles or indications what they were? They look like kicks or corn puffs or something. So, just not a lot to look at. There's some sediment on the bottom, which is hard to see. But I'm looking over and it's uh, doesn't look all that terribly interesting or active, but it is. So, we'll put it away a couple more days and look again. Okay, here we go with day 10 of the mead making. Let's pull it out of our little dark closet. And let's see what's in there. Oh. So I have a partially inflated balloon. So I have raisins floating at the top. It's hard to see and show, but there's a little sediment at the bottom. So the yeast are going, you know, looking around a little bit, more bubbles come out. So, it looks about the same, and everything seems to be progressing. When you smell it, it's a little yeasty, like beer. So I'd say it's going pretty good. Nothing to worry about. 
Bye.